So thinking about that and um, thinking about this uh, sort of general mix-up that starts to happen. Uh, a good example is um, the castles lay belle then was out. This, this is a painting thing that, and, and when you think, think that during the 17th and 18th century, the salon was, was, the, was, was the place where there's a great judgment as to what was beautiful or what was not beautiful, what was art or what was not art was being de debated and carried on. So you look at the Les Belles Demoiselles of Picasso's. He was relating, essentially, it's essentially a story about a brothel. It's, um, he related to the African masks when he was doing his referencing. Um, he was doing it in a whole new way of painting, this really abstract, gestural way of painting. And what was the reaction to it? The people in the salon said, this is ugly. This is not beauty. This is not art. And um, the reasons why was because of three different things. The Bardello was not a worthy subject matter, as within the common narrative, all of the stories of the church or of classical beauty were worthy subject matters. The second, we, there is no evidence of your artistic acumen in here. Your technique, we don't understand it, it looks like you don't have a technique. So that was the other area where the aesthetic of beauty was, was pushed to the side. Um, the third was, this is, who, what are these African masks? How do they connect with spirituality? We don't understand this. This is like a, a colonizing um, way of thinking. It's like, this is the other. These are the people that are over there. This is not us who's speaking. There's not a common springboard here for us to bound off of and appreciate and define art as beauty. So beauty got pushed to the side in fine arts. Uh, I think another example was the use of pink. Pink was sort of eschewed as being this color that was fluffy and weak and feminine. So not a lot of people were using pink. One of the only people that actually did end up using pink and bringing pink back in as a color was de Kooning, who kind of used pink in a mean way, you know, sort of the, you know, getting at the woman way. Um, so then we have all of this time of modernism when beauty gets pushed to one side. And, um, then we have postmodernism. Modernism has kind of run its course in terms of going as far in all of those individual directions as possible. There is come along, postmodernism is a sense of no longer are we now hanging on to our individual little um, things along the way. We have the possibility on the on the subway to be able to dance a little bit. You know, we can start here, we can go over to here, we can walk the length of the train. And um, we have a more of a fractured perspective. We're not so focusing on just one thing. And this is why one of the, the, um, the signifiers of postmodernism is the grid. The fact that there's not a single focal point, there's a number of different focal points that you can relate to. So, but what a grid does as well is it allows for inclusion. So you no longer have to think about um, my point of view being the only point of view and therefore ruling out the other points of view. It allows for looking in several, at several different places at once. So the primary, and I'm going to have to give my piece of paper again for the thing, but the primary writer in this new postmodernism movement that really is still actually embedded in modernism was Dantel, Theodore Dantel. And um, he wrote a book on this side of the page. Um, it was in 1969, and it, it's called Aesthetic Theory. And it, there's a quote in it. This is the quote. This shows to a certain extent how confused it became at the end of modernism. It is self-evident that nothing is self-evident in art anymore not its inner life, not its relation to the world, not even its right to exist. So this, and then he goes on to talk about the fact that what we actually need is a return to beauty. We have to return, we need a return to acceptance. After this, 
Um, that was adorable. Donto took off on this. He actually dedicated his book, opened it up with this dedication, saying that, that where we have to go to now is we have to go back to an investment, a belief in an aesthetic. We are not have to, but we have the option of being able to go back to this investment in a belief in beauty without feeling ashamed of it, without feeling that what we're doing is something that's weak, that something is that something that's not important. That beauty as an aesthetic in itself can be important. And then David Hickey, who is a contemporary theorist, um, took it a step further in his book, The Invincible Dragon, and in his, um, in his essay on beauty. And he, what he talks about beauty as being is um, an act of, an invitation into an act of generosity. And um, that, that would be, he, he gives a brilliant example of it, saying that if you're, if you're an artist, and you would very much like to have people look at your work. Um, and so you decide that what you're, you move to New York, let's say. What you decide that you're going to do is you're going to try and, you know, get to know this artist, that artist, the other artist. You're going to try and, and um, go to all the different galleries and see if you can get them interested in, the, in your work. This may or may not work. But what you can do that is likely to work is just to do your work to the utmost of your ability and then open the doors and invite people. So this idea of, um, it's, it, it's a reclamation of uh, a, positive, a positive energy, essentially. And this is what, this is very much what beauty is. Um, I think that, that one, of the, one, of the, one of the reactions that I strive for towards my own work, in my own work, and also one of the, the themes that I go towards in terms of being uh, a viewer of fine arts is um, what's called the wow reaction. This sense of, um, uh, sense of pleasure, a sense of happiness. It doesn't necessarily even have to be, it doesn't have to be light. It can be a sense of poignancy. But there has to be something there that um, is striking. And this, too, is another aspect of beauty. It's the idea of the handsome. Now, there's um, Charles Edward Jenneré and Amade Ozenfant wrote an essay that was quite pivotal in terms of that time in modernism when it, beauty was becoming a little lost to bring back into the fold the idea of beauty. Uh, Jenneré, by the way, is the producer. The architect. So, um, and his essay was called Purity. And in it, um, he says, I think I might actually have to use this as well. The goal of art is not simple pleasure, rather, it partakes of the nature of happiness. And I think that this exhibition of aligning with beauty is. Um, a successful exhibition, which was for me very much evidence at the opening, because there were a lot of people signing. And there were a lot of people happy. There were a lot of people that were, were uh, in the midst of the work and the feeling was positive. And um, in, a, in uh, an atmosphere right now, a contemporary critical atmosphere, um, where there's a lot of, of jadedness. There's a lot of, um, I'm just trying to think, what's, what's that word? Richard, you might be able to help me with this. What, Ed, Ed Giordano is... Um, irony, detached. Deta that's what it is. It's detached irony. There's a lot of a feeling, there's a lot of the sense of detached irony that you can, you can be sort of more or less critical of what is going on with a kind of detachment that, that you're not involved in it and therefore it's, it's easy to be critical. 